Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Raw, or Rules as Written, where we dive deep into the information that is out there, published and unpublished, third party, and we dig through everything to try to find exactly how it is meant to be in the DCC RPG rulebook. My name is Matt Robertson, otherwise known as Grape Ape, and my co-host... Yeah, I'm Stefan Strott, uh, otherwise known as uh, Dean Bad Wrong Fun on a few of those social medias. And we are going to be addressing questions tonight about clerics and their spells. And we're going to be joined by the wonderful, gracious, perfect Jess McDevitt. How are you tonight, Jess? Hey, how's everybody out there today? And what's been going on in your world? How are you doing? Doing pretty good. Um, I ran a couple games at Romance of Cyclops Con last weekend. Uh, they went really well. Um, I'm feeling comfortable enough that I'm going to start getting the module that I wrote ready for publication, I think. Nice. nice. So I'm getting excited. And if you guys don't know, Jess is the face behind the info at Goodman Games email that we send all of our problems to. She deals with it all. Um, <laughs> let's go ahead and start with the very questions from last week. We're going to get your take on the questions from last week really quick. Um, okay. The first one is, when rolling Mercurial Magic for newly acquired spells, do you use the current luck modifier of the caster or the lucky roll modifier, the static one? What's uh, what's your take on that, Jess? Um, I personally use the current luck. Um, I think when you go from zero level to first level, um, I go with what what the luck is as you do that. All right, and so that I think that's another vote. I think all three of us determined that that was how the uh, raw is. Um, the second one is when do material magic effects take place during spell casting, and are they dependent on success or failure of the casting? And we were split on this one. Um, you and Julia and Stefan uh, said that they are dependent upon success and take place after or during, and I said. I, I think they're meant to take place no matter what. Uh, what What do you think, Jess? I've played in both ways. Um, but I usually say the material effect happens as you cast it, and it happens whether it um, succeeds or fails. Yes. That's two for me, Stefan. Now we're tied. Yep. Two that's that's how two. I've ruled it, and that's how I've usually played it. Outstanding. All right, well, let's dive into the burning questions tonight. Our first question tonight, um, Elena, if you could kindly put that question up on the uh, teleprompter for us, please, is going to be how are spells chosen for the cleric class? Um, because there's there's a lot of discussion about this. Are they rolled randomly? Do the cleric get to pick? Uh, does the judge get to pick? Let's look at our well first. Uh, let's look at our first piece of evidence here. Handout one A on page twenty eight. It says a cleric can call upon the favor of his god. This form of magic is known as idle magic. Its successful use allows the cleric to channel his god's power as a magical spell. A cleric has access to the spells of his god as noted on table 1-5. Stefan, how do you interpret that right off the bat? Off the bat, I say the cleric is, you know, is is praying to their deity. It's not a thematically, it's not one gets to just do it. So I, I think that is something that, to me, it sounds like a discussion that the player should be having with their their judge. And Jess, so it's they kind of just they have they have to align on it. Okay. And just what do you think? Um, mostly when I've had a cleric in the um 
the party, I've usually given them a uh, pre-gen, um, but I have also played where the cleric has gotten spells as they've gotten higher up in levels, and we usually rolled on the table. Um, if it came up the same spell you already had, you just re-rolled um, to get another one, but I've also seen some judges say, you know, pick what you would like. Um, and, and the table yeah. is numbered, and for the wizard spells, mm -hmm. it specifically states, you know, that they roll randomly on that table. So you would think, mm -hmm. you know, that would probably go the same for Claire. It does not, however, say in the rule book the same for Claire. I just so everyone knows, right. we are using the eighth printing of the rule book. Um, if you're trying to follow along with us, uh, I think we can all agree that by that first handout right there, the powers come from the god. So the spell transfers mm -hmm. from whatever deity they worship and is infused into the idol that they are carrying of their god, representative of their deity. And that is how the power channels. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah, for Hopefully the most part. The yeah. Um, I would also say um, talk to your judge um, because, you know, they know where this is going to, where the campaign is going to go. And if you feel like you should have maybe one spell and they feel you should have another, you know, have the, have the discussion. Um, see, see if maybe you can make your case for the, the spell you want. Um, or like I said, I mean, I've been in games that I necessarily have not played a cleric, but there's been a cleric in the party that got a new spell and we ro they rolled on the table. Um, some of them have said, okay, pick a spell. It's, I, I think it's really up to the judge how they feel they want to do it. That is true. And that is well documented in the RPG. But just we need a concrete decision here. We need a definition of what the raw is meant to be. And I'm going to throw you guys for a loop right here. This little gem, this thing that could change everything that I found <laughs> in the Goodman Games Forum. Elena, can we jump to hand out 1G? And this is from the Dark Master himself, JG Joseph Goodman. Discussing cleric spells versus level versus wizard spells, known level limit. And he says on June 8th, 2011, at 8.05 p.m., for a long time, I played that clerics had access to all spells of their deity slash per level. So basically, a level one cleric has access to all level one spells. Given the structure of cleric spellcasting in the form of a compounding negative one penalty per cast, this works out okay. The cleric may have eight spells, which is actually now 11, but he can only cast a couple before he loses power, considering he's also healing and turning undead and using his uh, cleric abilities. So... Joseph Goodman is kind of directing us to say, and this is kind of a new way to look at it, I've never seen anybody play this way, that all the cleric spells are up for, up for choice, and that a cleric would get to determine what spells out of those 11 they would want at the start of every day. What do you guys think about that? Oh, I will say, you know, because those eagle-eyed viewers will, will know, you this is 2011, in which this was posted on the forums. That's before the official publication of Dungeon Crawl Classic. So he's, you know, some of it in there, that compounding minus one per cast, that's a reference to some beta rules that, you know, aren't in the game anymore. Um, and they did so. get kind of change as a compounding negative one to disapproval if it's failure. So they're not in there, but an alliteration of them is in there. Uh, before I uh, go, no, hand it over. I'm handing it over to. I was going to say, <laughs> if if I okay, my rule probably would be, you have X amount of spells that you get anyhow at level one. 
yes, you do have access to those other ones, but yes, you have to do it as a penal at a penalty because you don't you've not actually gotten those from your God per se, and you've not actually studied those spells. Yes, you know them. It would be the same concept as um okay, I know how to draw a stick figure but i do, i can do that but i can't go and make a whole piece of artwork um i i'm at a penalty at that for you know so i would say for the rule yes you can use them but you are at a penalty all right so let me try to convince you guys even further if we go to, uh, I actually think I missed a handout on this. Um, if we go under magic, under how the cleric casts, well, it was the first handout. A cleric has access to the spells of his god as noted on table 1-5. So if we bring up uh, handout 1-D, that is in fact table 1-5. And where it differs is I've highlighted in the green, it says spells known by level. I think that is a significant factor in my new train of thought, because for the wizard it just says spells known. This one says spells known by level. So I think the rules state in, in a very unclear fashion that the cleric knows all of those 11 spells, but can call upon four of them per day because it would know all the first level spells uh, according to that chart on table 1-5. What do you guys think? I say I think it's a totally valid way to play. I've run a game like that before. Um, uh, I What I did so uh, was also that at the beginning of each day, you pray for your spells, and I basically did a, like, okay, you have to meet the minimum spell check to succeed on that spell, and if you do that for each one that you pray for, you get that. Your god is listening to you. Oh, if you wow. don't meet that spell check, your god is saying no, and you have to randomly roll, and you get whatever you do, re-rolling duplicates. I, I do kind of like that. So, I mean, they have the innate ability to lay on hands, they have the innate ability to turn unholy, um, they can call for divine aid. So they have things that they have at their access at all times. But let's say they know they're going into a village that is suffering from a drought and they're starving. And the cleric says, well, it might be a good idea for me to prep food of the gods going into this village. Um, you know, that kind of opens up the limited number of cleric spells because wizards have much, many more spells. Uh, wizards have access to 26 different spells, while the poor cleric only has 11. So giving them the choice of all 11 of those per day really kind of opens up the cleric class. What do, you, what do you think about that, Jess? Yeah, I would say this is how I would do it. If you're doing a campaign, they have access to all 11 spells. But if you're doing it as a... Um, convention play pick the four for level one pick the five for whatever level you're doing it go ahead as the judge pick them because like again you know where you're going to take this this module pick those don't give them access i would say to the other ones these are the ones you have for can't for um convention play but if you're doing a campaign yeah every day go ahead let them pick the spells then all right so kind of a 50 50 let's see if mm -hmm. we can find any more kind of clarification on this elaine if we bring out handout 1c uh page 106 in the eighth printing of the rule book says clerics receive the direct assistance of their gods in a style of magic called idol magic which may or may not be similar to the powers of wizards um so we've got clarification right there that it's kind of your game you can have them be similar to wizards where they can roll um, or they or you can do something different 
but it does define once again that the assistance comes directly from those deities and is idol magic. You guys agree with that? I agree with that, yeah. Mm -hmm. You got to have your holy symbol. That's your little idol. Right. All right. So if we determine that the rules state that the powers come from the gods, the spells come from the gods, uh, I guess let's get our votes real quick on, on if we think that the clerics can choose spells out of the entire entirety of the 11 listed daily. Stefan, what's your vote on that? It, as a rule. Yes. Rules. I'll say yes. Jess, what do you think? I'd say yes. I say yes as well. So now we have kind of an entirely different train of thought. But now that leads to the question is, if those spells are coming from the gods, how do we know what spells go with what gods? So if we bring out handout 1B, uh, on page 32, it gives us a tiny little tidbit. The eternal struggle between law and chaos continues on a vast scale, measured in the life and death of stars. In a man's brief time on Earth, he chooses one antipod, and in doing so, plays his tiny part in the eternal struggle. As such, a first-level cleric is either a cleric of law, chaos, or the balance. So that, you know, kind of determines, well, you got to choose good, bad, or indifferent. and the spells aren't really laid out that way. Um, but I did find these other tidbits on the Goodman Games forum. And we're going to bring up one now from handout 1E, which is from Captain Zap, and I have no idea who this is. Uh, but it says, in lieu of the guidelines, this is what he's come up with. And this is in 2021. He kind of mashes all four options together, which I really like. The first spell of each level is chosen by the cleric's player, so they get to choose one they want. The second spell is chosen by the judge. The third spell is level, is, of each level is randomized, so they roll for that one. And then the fourth one they can choose as a daily spell, so that one can change multiple times. What do you guys think about that? That doesn't bother me. Um... Yeah, I kind of actually like that. I like that a lot. I like it too. That it, mixes pure, up pure, pure. Uh, you know, Judge Fiat there making those rules. Not, it's not the rules as written, but I like that rule nonetheless. Yeah, yeah that that kind of incorporates all angles of it. It gets interaction with the judge. It gets interaction with the player. Um, Stefan, talk to us a little bit about rules as written versus rules as intended. Uh, so, yeah, with, with rules as written, you're going 100% by the book, but um, not everything is perfect. Uh, there are updates to each edition, typos, uh, that infamous kind of luck added to your spell thing, or luck modifier added to your spell thing that's getting taken out. Um, rules as written are not always perfect, so it's I think it's also important to look at the intent of the wording behind the rules and realize that sometimes mistakes do happen. Um, to briefly get off of Dungeon Crawl Classics for a second, for for Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition, they got that um, Sage Advice column and Twitter post where you know you'll have the the high ups at WotC, you know Jeremy Crawford and people clarifying rules that are have fiddly little wording to them, and I I don't think anything like that needs to exist for Dungeon Crawl Classic because things aren't quite so fiddly. Um, but yeah, that's the gist of it. Okay. So our last handout for this question is handout, well, it might be second to last, handout 1F. Um, and this is kind of a statement, I believe, in response to uh, other questions in which Joe's already clarified. But this is from Hamakto. Uh, again, I have no idea who that is. Uh, but he says everything is subject to change per Joseph. And this guy, by the post in that conversation, sounds like he's played with Joseph Goodman. Uh, on multiple occasions. Uh, he said he played a cleric at Gamers Plus, perhaps in playtesting. And if we scroll down to number two, he says they get all the spells of their level in memory, and they can access however many per day as listed on table 1-5. Um, so that kind of makes me think that it's an option. So you would 
with a list of 11 spells, possibly eight at that time, and you're able to choose four of them, kind of like we discussed. Uh, but that kind of backs that up a little bit. Um, one other little tidbit, last handout for this question, is handout 1H. Uh, on page 28, it says, A cleric who changes alignment loses the support of his god. He loses access to all spells and powers from cleric levels earned under his own alignment. So, piecing this out, let's say your cleric is lawful and just starts doing chaotic things. He starts you know, having no mercy, you know, uh, pillaging and uh, taking over a town, uh, stealing from other players, whatnot, all kinds of nefarious uh, tricks. Yeah, I would say he changes alignment. But it says he loses access to all the spells and powers from cleric levels. Uh, so it's kind of decreeing those levels of spells under his own alignment. And he would have to switch to a different alignment and gain different kind of spells. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Jess? I would... Let's see. I would probably say, okay, yes, you have changed alignment. You have to take a week of basically rest, for lack of a better term, to learn your new spells um, under your new alignment. Because, yeah, your lawful spells are not going to be you know, chaotic, or even if you go neutral, those lawful spells or even chaotic spells, they're still going to tip the scales in one way or the other. So okay. I would say you, there's a period that you have to wait before you can cast spells again. I, I would think so too. Uh, first, you would have to, you know, find a new god and Get mm -hmm. them to accept you. I mean, the chaotic ones would probably love to have you right away, though. Oh, yeah. uh, then we kind of get to our second question. Um, and Elaine, if you could put up question number two What are the spells of each deity? Um, we've all agreed that they should know all the spells of their gods and that the gods, the spells come from the gods themselves. So, how do you determine what those spells are? If we look at the 11 listed for first level, we have Blessing, Darkness, Detect Evil, which could also be Detect Good, Detect Magic, Food of the Gods, Holy Sanctuary, Paralysis, Protection from Evil, Resistance from Cold or Heat, Second Sight, and Word of Command. Those are all kind of generic spells. So my take on it is that these 11 listed here are known by probably all the gods. And that is why they're listed in the book in that uh, kind of blanket format. These are the ones you get to choose from. The annual has specific spells, usually a first, third, and fifth level for each god. And there's some in the RP DCC RPG as well. Um, but what is your guys' thoughts on, are those 11 spells listed? Are they Would they be considered good, evil, and neutral? What do you think? I, I think so. I, I think yeah. they're all up for grabs. I, yeah, I agree. because those, yeah, I think you're right. I think they would be known by all the gods. Um, I, I consider those base spells. Um, you know, like almost like breathing. You know, you, you, you already know those. You know how to breathe. You know how to you know, go get a glass of water, you know how to do this, you know how to do that. I would consider those basically your everyday, mundane, you know them, all gods know them. I, I think you're dead on on that. So we've kind of determined that those are 11 are up for grabs for any god. And, and Dice Station Zebra says in the chat, if cleric spells are granted via a cleric's god, what are thoughts about cleric spells on scrolls? So my thoughts on that are they are inscribed by the cleric, uh, perhaps in some temple or something like that, uh, but they're written in format for that particular god. So if I wrote a holy sanctuary spell, 
in the Temple of Justicia and a cleric of um what's one of the evil gods, Stefan? Oh, uh let's say the the hidden lord. And a, and a cleric of the hidden lord cast that spell. That's still under the the hidden lord's purview as having that spell, but it's been transcribed by a cleric of Justicia. Perhaps he might uh you know get a negative one spell check on that or something. Um, they, I think they would still be able to cast those spells, but uh, that would be up for judges' determination on if anything extra happens. Personally, what do you think, Jess? go ahead, Jess. Personally, I probably would give it more a two or a three penalty, uh, because of it being scribed in one god's way, and another god's cleric is trying to, um cast that spell i would give it i would think a higher penalty because you're 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 having to overcome how that was written for god a from god x okay I, that's I, my I like, thoughts I, I think that'd be a good place to use um alignment language in your games if you want to you can say oh yeah you're you're a chaotic guy you, you worship the hidden lord you got this justicia scroll normally i'd make that a minus two or three, but you do know how to speak and read lawful, so only a minus one. Oh, okay. that's a good point, and that mm -hmm. is a good use for the very underused alignment language. If the uh, the language of the spell is written in is in alignment language. I, I guess we need to get our votes on the first question. How are spells chosen for the cleric class? I vote that they can choose whatever number of spells by their level um, out of the entirety of the level listed. Uh, so they can choose four out of the 11 per day by praying to their deity. Stefan, how do you vote? I vote yes, but it's uh, the praying to the deity. The deity has to say yes, and, and the judge gets to be uh, the, the interpretation of that deity. So right. give your players some, some goodies, but maybe don't give them everything. And Jess, how do you vote? Oh my! Um, the pressure is on. I like, Everybody's watching. I, I know. I think I like how Stefan did it. Yeah. Um, you have to get the approval of your god okay. for the spells you want. All right. So now we can head back to question two. Now that we've definitively decided that, I'll, I'll spells... add one addendum real quick. If your play, you mentioned earlier, you gotta, you have to use. Your powers, right? Not act chaotic. So if uh, if your player was using a certain spell in a not so cool kind of way, according to their deity, don't give them that spell for a while. Mm -hmm. That's true. Maybe that one is withheld. Uh, so what are the spells of the deities? And I combed through the forum and I found a little blurb by Manly Michael Curtis, who said. The Gazetteer of the Known Realms, DCC 35, has a hint about what they may or may not be. And so I read all of DCC 35, and uh, if we could bring up handout 2A, Elena. Uh, first of all, there are many more gods listed in DCC 35, uh, but here is uh, half of the section of them. And it has the ones that we, some of the ones that we know on there, of course, Karanis, Ildevir, um, Danethar is on there. But it gives a portfolio of what kind of purview they fall under, as well as certain domains. Um, so if we looked at Danethar, Earth, Industry, Vows, and Trust. Out of the 11 that we already determined are open to any god, if you wanted to create more, in your game, if they dealt with earth, industry, vows, and trust, uh, that would be a good one to do. And, you know, under the domains, earth, good, law, protection. Uh, so, you know, protection spells, maybe spells that move or transmute the earth. Uh, what do you guys think about that? I think Stephen, that's... I think that's a, a great way to do it, and that's a, that's a great little piece of reference material for folks. Um, and more than that, you can also you know, use that in tandem with the annual. I have no clue if they referenced this when writing the annual, published so long ago. 
they may not have, or they may right. have. Um, but either. seeing how that was translated into the canticles could be a good way to help, you know, guide homebrew folks into making something new. And I think this goes with the mentality that judges should create anything that they feel is missing from the game. If you feel there's not enough cleric spells, create more cleric spells. And this is kind of your guideline of the spells that these gods might have in their repertoire. Um, if we look down at the Hidden Lord way at the bottom, you know, you've got secrets, misdirection, um, knowledge, trickery. Uh, so you could come up with all kinds of spells for secrets and stuff like that. Maybe even finding secrets. Uh, a spell to discover trap doors or secret doors. Um, if we bring out Handout 2B, uh, we'll look at another blurb from the DCC 35, Gazetteer of the Known Row. Uh, this one is about Justicia, and it gives a little more detail about all the gods listed in there, um, but goes into a little bit more depth on what their personality is. Um, so, you know, just looking at it, she's the goddess of mercy, justice, and defensive combat right there on the third line. You could come up with spells, you know, for mercy, justice, or defensive combat. Or you could look in other alliterations of other books to see if you can find similar spells. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Jess? How do how do the how does how does a judge determine what spells go with what deity? Um, I would. That is a good question. Um. I would say probably look at the deity first. See more what alignment that is. And then say, okay, according to your deity, you should probably go with these types of spells. Stay away from blank and go more with like, you know, I would say with with justicia i would say more like food of the gods more where you're helping somebody um because she seems more like a helpful type of of deity what about like justice spells i mean her name is justice so what if there is uh someone who is wronged uh you could also throw some spells in there like to uh to bind someone if they're being unjust that is very a little, true a little offensive action as well as a mm -hmm. kind of supportive action if we bring up handout um to see um we also have a little bit this is in the eighth printing so this is a little bit of directive uh, on page 400 it said, the, cler the clerics worship enigmatic Cthulhu gods and wield spells designed to bind and subdue. Uh, so that's just a little tidbit in there that kind of gives you more direction on what kind of spells you would create for the gods. So in the DCC RPG, eighth printing of the rulebook, there are not anything that I could find that designates what gods have access to what spells or what deity spells fall under that idle magic that we discussed earlier. I combed through it. I didn't find anything. But there are little guidelines like this one right here. Spells that bind and subdue. Um, so that leads me to believe that the rulebook is meaning for you to create those types of spells to give Cleric those accesses. You guys have any thoughts on that? I I think yeah, you should absolutely. The the clerics have a few less spells in the core rulebook, and mm -hmm. some of them are overlap. Some wizard, some cleric spells, the wizard can also get, and vice versa. But um, reflavor the wizard spells and give them to clerics if you want. You know, Dainthar is the mountain lord, but transmute earth is listed as just a wizard spell. Why why can't the mountain lord transmute, you know, give one of his clerics the power to transmute, you know, the mountain? There's nothing stopping it, that from happening. And it makes sense with the, the theme and the lore. Absolutely. That's a great point. Take all those withered spells that are listed and just change them into cleric versions. Well, um, and I... So, 
Go ahead. I've also talked to Joe about some of this sometimes when, you know, somebody is <clears throat> written in with a question. And one thing that he always says, it's your game. You're the judge. If you want to give one of your clerics a wizard spell, give them a wizard spell. Um, if you want to say, no, I'm going to do this exactly how this is said, as the rules are written, you can play it that way too. You can you can make it as fun or as by the book as you want. Um, again, it's your game. Do I would say do what you feel is comfortable and what you feel your care your your players can handle. And I, and that's how I am too. I, I love to know kind of what the rules as written are, and and be able to understand them 100% in their entirety. I think that's my OCD. Um, and then change them from there. You know, I, I it, it's mentioned several times in the rule book to change the rules to fit to your games. Uh, but I want to know exactly what were they meant when they wrote this down. And that kind of speaks on to what Stefan said is about rules as written versus rules as intended. Um, so, if we answer our question, um, what are the spells of each deity? Stefan, I'm going to let you go first this time. What's your answer to that question? Whatever thematically fits. And, it, and it's not just restricted to what's on the, the given list. Because why, why can a wizard, you know, is going back to Danthar. Is Danthar not more powerful than a mortal wizard? He can have what he wants. They might not all be mortal. It could be supernatural patron. That might be another show. Supernatural versus godlike powers. Which one's stronger? Mm -hmm. um, my answer to that question is what are the spells of each deity? Um, my answer is that they aren't listed. Uh, you have the 11 in the book, and those are open to every deity. But anything further than that is completely judges creation and is determined by how you perceive each one of those gods. Um, so they are open to creation is what my answer is. Um, Jess, what is your answer? What are the spells of each deity? I would have to agree with Stefan that it's situational. Um, it, it depends on the game. Um, if you, as a judge, know that, hey, we're going to be going into the deep mountains, we're going to need this, we're going to need that, possibly, let, let the cleric have that spell from their deity. Um, you know, even if you have to, you know, write it up real fast at the last minute, um, you know, give them a spell that is going to possibly further the party and help the party um, than not give them something that, you know, might not help move, move the, the, the game along. And not only that players, all those players out there, you guys that are playing clerics, bring spells up to your judge say, Hey, I worship this God. I think this spell might fall under this judge purview. And give that to your judge and say, do you approve this? Um, so players, you have agency too. Um, you can look at the guy that you support and say, hey, I've got a list of five spells here. Uh, would any of these be approved? And send it to your judge. And I bet you most of them will say, yeah. You know, you'll have to come up with spell results for them. But, uh, you know, that's not too hard. There's hundreds of spells out there to choose from. You don't have to come up with the spell results for every single level either. You look at the canicles, they don't do that. A lot of them just have four different spell result levels. All right. So let's address one little question right here from uh, from Pavlo, Pavlo John. Would thieves be able to fake it and cast a cleric spell from a scroll? Um, we actually have this as a question uh, for a future episode. Can thieves read arcane magic, uh, you know, with a read languages ability? Um, 
we're going to have to dive into that because there's a whole list of rules for scrolls and stuff like that. But as I understand the rules without diving into it, anyone can read the spell from a scroll. Uh, now, if you incorporated the alignment language that Stefan talked about, which is a great idea for its use, uh, then maybe they can. Um, so we will find out more about that in a future episode. But we're going to get to our third question tonight. And Lenny, if you could bring up question number three. When a cleric is laying on hands, how much healing does lay on hands provide? And I thought that I had, like, super information to break the game, uh, but then I found a rule that completely blew that. Uh, but if we look at handout 3A, this is the rules as written. Page 30, the number of dice healed cannot exceed the target's hit dice or class level. For example, a cleric healing a level one first level character cannot heal with more than one die even if they roll well. Uh, so the explanation of that rule is your cleric heals the thief. The hit, thief's hit dice are D6. That means they can't roll a D8, a D10, or a D12. They have to roll the D6. And if they're a first level thief, they only get to roll one D6, even if the cleric rolls a 20 and they happen to be the same alignment. Is that how you understand it as well, Jess? Um, how I do it, is okay you rolled that you can roll three d6s go ahead and roll those three d6s take the highest number that's what you're healed and stefan i think you do it that way as well correct I, it's it's not rules as written but that is how i do it. theoretically it it says you can't because it's limited by class level but i've thought recently hey don't we have that d4 from being zero level at some point can't i roll a D4 also, you know, if you're with a, maybe you could argue that to a judge that doesn't use the, the Deschain rule, as I've heard it called. Well, let's look at handout 3B, and that kind of addresses it a little bit. Page 30, it is always a number of dice with the ty type of dice determined by the hit dice of the creature to be healed. So their hit dice, to answer your question or statement, is at zero level, their hit dice are four, 1d4. But as soon as they go to first level, their hit dice are 1d4, 6, 8, 10, or 12. Um, so it determines by the hit dice of the creature to be healed. For example, a warrior uses a d12 hit die, so a warrior is healed with a d12 dice. Uh, I, I don't think I would let that, I don't think I would let that argument fly, Stefan. Unless you can convince me. I probably couldn't, but it's something to think about. Maybe maybe that's a magical item that someone can make up and their cleric can find out. Oh, that's a good idea. You know, benefits of your zero level life. Um, so just lost my train of thought. So three A, uh, as we were discussing, um rules as written in the book is they cannot heal higher than the level of the person they are trying to heal. And so after I determined that and had it locked in my brain, I, I play the same way that Jess and, and Stefan do, uh, that you if you heal 3D8, you roll 3D8 and take the best one if you're level one. But rules is written, or you can't heal more than your level, just so you know, everyone out there. So after I read that, I was like, well, what about Handout 3E. Elaine, if you could bring out Handout 3E. What if you have a first level character that is blind from a spell? Or some kind of poison or something like that. Anyway, they've gotten cut across the eyes and they're blind. And the cleric says, I want to go up and heal them. And they roll a 22. Um, and technically that should heal them. But if they're only first level, they can only heal one dice. So a first level character would never be able to be healed of blindness or deafness. Jess, what's your opinion on that? Okay. So it says to heal blindness, you have to reach a four dice healing roll. Okay. As it, to me, how it is written, 
is those ones that are above it that say like organ damage to die you know blah 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 those whatever that says that's what it heals whether you're zero level first level tenth level whatever that says i would go with what that die says so if you have organ damage and it says two die you do two d12 d6 d8 whatever but if you are feeling say blindness i would say the first time around you can maybe heal the the eye and the the cut for one one die the next time if they want to try a, a the next round around if they want to try the blindness and they get a high enough um number or they roll high enough to get say the five dice whatever the highest is plus i would say like maybe plus two or three to cure the blindness then because you've already healed the eye and the like where they've cut across that was your first round second round then you can try to heal the blindness that's how i would roll it yeah and so those conditions your your first statement is on if it says two conditions those conditions are healed and i and i thought i had come upon a game breaking moment stefan where i was like if, if you're first level you can never heal any of those conditions <laughs> and then i found handout um 3d uh elena if you could bring up 3d page 30 it says finally before rolling his spell check as john pointed out in the chat the cleric may elect to heal a specific condition instead of hit points. Healed dice translate to conditions as noted below. In this case, the target's hit dice or class level do not act as a ceiling. And so, so trick that, question, Jess. You passed. Uh, it was a trick question, Jess. <laughs> And so I kind of shot my whole thing in the foot. I was like, oh, man, I thought I was on to something there. We've all been playing wrong. And then I found that thing that John already knew about. Uh, so, yeah, it, to, to fool conditions, uh, to heal conditions, um, you can definitely, the class level do not act as a ceiling. But rules is written. If it's a first level character, even though it says they get three dice, they are only supposed to get one dice. Um, have you guys seen it played any other way? I know we talked about rolling all three and taking the best one. I like that. Um, have you guys seen anything else out there for healing? Mm -mm. No, I haven't. And so to finish up the question, in rules as written, let's get our votes. How much healing does Lay on Hands provide? Rules as written, it provides the number of hit dice up to whatever level the target being healed. Stefan, what's your vote? Uh, rules is written. You can only heal a, a level one character one hit die. They don't get a roll and choose the best. But I'm going to ignore rules is written and, and use that to chain roll because uh, I don't think clerics should be penalized or characters should be penalized for being low, but even when they roll well. Mm -hmm. All right, Jess, and what is your vote, your final word on it? I agree. Yeah, I'm I'm going to throw the rules written out and, yeah, let them take however many they are able to get, take the highest. All because, right. yeah, they shouldn't be penalized for being first and second level. Oh, I mean, Sketch would say we're all too kind of judges and that we are. Uh, you know, being way too nice to our players, but I, I agree. I think we all, and, and I think most of the community has kind of uh, adopted that rule. I've seen it a lot more often in games. Um, more often than not. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. So the last kind of point we probably need to make on that is if they're healing a condition, uh, rules is written, is that they do not get any healing point damage, healing points back from that. Um, so if you're healing a cut off arm or a punctured lung, um, you can seal the punctured lung, um, but they would not gain any hit points from that. Uh, would you guys agree with that? Yes, that's 
how, how I run it. Sometimes uh, players have whined a little bit, but I go, your lung is better. Isn't that enough for you? <laughs> yeah, because you can always have your cleric um, next time around try to get some hit points back for them. You know, you've healed, you've healed the condition, the punctured lung, and, you know, let the cleric heal anybody else that needs to be healed, and then if they can come back to you and get you hit points, then okay. But if they've taken too much um, disapproval, I'm sorry, your lung is better, but you're going to have to deal with the hit points that you have. Right. So we are nearing the close of our show. Um, I, I don't think we have time to get to our fourth question. We had four prepared, but I think this one is going to take quite a bit of discussion because uh, I did find some stuff about that. Um, let's go ahead and save that one for another episode. Stefan, what do you got coming up in the next couple weeks? Anything? Oh, well, I'm going to be at uh, North Texas RPG Con from, on Thursday and Friday only. But uh, I'll see people who are there then. Then uh, in just uh, just a little over a couple weeks, on the 14th of next month, I'm launch launching a Kickstarter for an MCC thing. So if uh, people like Merchants of the Multiverse, the last MCC zine, that's a mouthful um, that I did. Uh, they'll like this one, too. The layout's nicer this time because I've learned a lot. Outstanding. Jess, what do you got uh, in your foreseeable, fu foreseeable future? Anything coming up? Not really game-related per se, but um, I do have a major um, craft show coming up that's literally an eighth of a mile down the road from us. It's a five-day show, so I'm going to be getting prepared for that, and uh, we'll be posting a lot of pictures on that, so I'm getting I... excited about it. I heard a rumor that you were having notebooks made uh, of the wizard van. Is that true? It is, yes. Um, I'm going to be working on those um, coming up. Uh, and we're going to be doing some for um, an auction that Jim Kitchen is doing uh, to raise money. Um, and then I am, I did get permission from Joe that if anybody would like to buy one, um, I can make some. So I will be getting the, um, I'll get pictures of those up and I'll post them in uh, DCC RPG Rocks uh, Facebook page. Very cool. Uh, so. Myself, I will also be at NTRPG, North Texas RPG Con, um, Thursday through Sunday, June 2nd through the 5th. I'm running a couple DCC games. And I am in a Jim Warbler MCC game. I'm very excited about that. That'll be fun. Um, cool. Yeah, should be fun. So tonight we have determined, for all the viewers out there, how are the spells chosen for the cleric class? And I think we came to consensus that it's all 11. And rules is written. Um, if you look at the inferments and the lack of information and the hidden paths and, and passages in there. Um, give it a try. Give them all 11 and let them pick whatever out of those 11 they want per day. Um, when they pray to get rid of their disapproval at the end of the day, uh, just see how it goes. Um, and then what are the spells of each deity? Um, those are determined by, you've got clues in the Gazetteer of the Known Realm, DCC 35. You've got clues in the Annual. Um, and you've got some clues in the DCC RPG, and it talks about the gods in there. So look at the description of the gods and how their demeanor, what their um, characteristics are, and create spells from that. And a great idea from Stefan, take all the wizard spells. Take all the wizard spells and transform them into cleric spells, so change in a few words. Oh, and speaking of that, that's the other thing I'm working on. I'm trying to get a zen together of reverse spells. Uh, so hopefully that will expand the spell repertoire, and hopefully I can get that done by August. Uh, I think that's the new Zen Quest. And the last thing is how much healing does Lay on Hands provide? Rules is written. It's only the dice of each level. Um, nothing more, but you can cure all those conditions. 
Next two weeks from now, uh, the date is going to be, let's see, June 7th. We are going to have the Pizza Paisan himself. Joey Royale will be our guest, and we'll be discussing dwarves, their mighty deeds, the shield bash, and their underground skill ability. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Have a good night, and we'll see you in two weeks. Goodbye. Bye. Yes.